Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your boy, Jarrell Mason, better known by some as Jay Mason. Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. With me right now, I have a man who is a part of the East Coast family with Michael Bivens and Biv 10, multi-platinum producer, jack of all trades, Mr. Mark Payne. Mr. Payne, thank you for coming on to Beyond the Album Cover, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you. No problem. And I want to send a very special thank you before we get started to the interview to my boy, Kali, for sending this up. Thanks, Kali. Cool. Yep. Big shout out to Kali. Yes, sir. And you can catch that interview on Beyond the Album Cover, where you stream and where you watch on YouTube. So let's go ahead and jump right into the interview, Mr. Payne. How did mm -hmm. you come to the idea of I want to be in the music industry? Was it something that you had in the idea of your mind since you were born or did you just stumble into wanting to get into the music business? So, and when I first started, it wasn't really like a music industry thing because when hip hop's when hip hop was evolving, it was back in the early what, 70s and 80s. So when we heard records, we wasn't really thinking about joining the music industry. We just enjoyed the music. You know what I'm saying? It was entertaining for us. Um, I think that after maybe when I say about in the late 80s, maybe like 90s, when everybody started joining like, you know, Tribe Called Quest, Buster Rhymes, you know what I mean? EPMD, um, Eric B and Rock came. When we started seeing them come into the industry, then that's when we started taking it seriously. Like we were like, they're making money from this. You know, it's not no longer just a form of entertainment. They're making money from it. So, and then we would occasionally see these artists, you know, driving in extravagant cars and having nice jewelry on and nice clothes. So he's like, oh, they, they're making money from this. So that's when we started, well, me, me per se, I started taking it seriously because of those reasons. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't just about making money, but I, I wanted to do what I love to do and also get paid for it. So that was like maybe, in the early, I'd say, late 80s, beginning of 90s. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of put me into it more on the entertainment side of entertainment, making money type side of it. But prior to that, um, when I was eight years old, it was a way to, for me to make a living with my family. We lived in the Caribbean, the Virgin Islands, and there were no other way to make money. So me and my uncle used to play locally in the parks, and then we would, I would, um, collect money, you know what I mean, from the tourists that came into the into the docks and stuff like that. And then I would um, we uh, stayed there for a couple of hours, and then at the end of the day, you know, we had enough money to at least you know feed ourselves for the day or for a week. You know what I mean? So that was when I was a kid, but I wasn't really paying attention too much of you know what I mean, the music industry at that time. It was just more or less survival. Later on in life, as I got older, in my late teens and stuff. You know, as I said, when hip hop started evolving and then we started seeing other other groups and acts making money, that's when we started taking the suit. You know? Right. Now, did you do the talent show circuit throughout high school? And do you remember the first record that you purchased that said, man, this I can envision myself doing? What was that one artist or group that really put the battery in your back, so to speak? Uh, I, I would say Cool G Rap is like one of the like when he's, his album came out, it was like undeniable. You know what I mean? Like to me, he's like one of the best lyricists in hip hop. So when his album came out, it was like, wow. If I could, you know, I went and bought the album. You know what I mean? Like I just to hear him lyrically, you know what I mean? And it's just, he was amazing, you know? And then um, Biz Markie was another one. You know, Biz Markie kind of took over the industry with the beatboxing and you know, the music behind the beatbox and he had very catchy, you know, hooks and stuff like that, that kind of drew me in. So I had a copy of his too, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But between those two, I would say Cool G Rap and Biz Mark. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned both Cool G Rap and the late great Biz Marquee, and how both of them affiliated with the Juice Crew, you know, Marley Mall, rest in peace, Mr. Magic. And can we talk about the impact of the Juice Crew and that whole movement that uh, Marley Mall and Mr. Magic had? 
Right. Um, but you know what? Actually, I drew more into um, the Juice Crew by hearing MC Shan first. You know what I mean? Like MC Shan was like the father of the Juice Crew. And of course, when KRS one came out and, you know, dismembered them with the, the bridges over, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it was, it was interesting to watch something like that. But I was actually in Marley Mall's house recording, doing a beatbox, you know what I'm saying? When I was in, I say around when I was 14. Like, I think he was at that time looking for a beatbox. I was with a crew of people that already had a, I was already in a group. And we went to Marley's house to record a song. And when I did the beatbox, Marley was like, I need him, him. But the crew was like, nah, we can't, you know what I'm saying? We're not just gonna leave, let you have him and we can't be involved. So that messed up my situation to be, to work with Marley, you know what I mean? But I didn't know that until later, later in, in as I got older, a person in the group told me that's what happened. And I was like, wow, that's just interesting. But I've known Marley since like way before MC Shan even came out, you know? Wow, and it's definitely crazy, you know, with all of the legendary hits that Marley Mall ended up producing in and out of the Juice Crew. And of course, we know everybody that came out of there. You mentioned MC Shan, we mentioned Kooji Rap, this Marquis, Master Ace, Craig G, Big Daddy Kane, mm -hmm. Roxanne Shante, mm -hmm. Granddaddy IU. I mean, that whole movement was something serious. Yeah, they used to set off the whole hip hop. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, Karis one single handedly took care of them, but they actually were the ones that actually set off that Queens, you know what I'm saying, um, trend of, you know, wow, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, when they did the symphony and they was all together and they was flying in jets and, you know what I'm saying, and dip, they had on different scheme outfits and stuff, that was like, yo, that's just, you can't stop these guys. They, they're incredible. You know? Right, right. And it's crazy that you mentioned how, you know, each borough had their own particular style, their own particular sound. You know, Juice Crew was different from BDP and from the different boroughs in New York. And it was still friendly competition. But when it came to that mic on that stage, you was going to yeah. rip it up. Yes, of course, of course. Right, that was back when hip hop had that true essence of the friendly competition. And then you mentioned the Virgin Islands and how if it wasn't for the islands, no hip hop, the connection, the intersectionality between hip hop and reggae and how Cool Herc took the sound systems yeah. from Jamaica right. and planted it when he came over to New York, had that basement mm -hmm. party at Sedgwick and Cedar and started this whole movement called hip hop and that later led to the part jams and everything that we see today. So can we talk about right. the intersections between hip hop and reggae and how if it wasn't for reggae, none of this would be possible. Right, right. right. So um, reggae for me, when living in the Virgin Islands, um, was a vibe. Reggae had a vibe to it for me. And um, you ever heard of a song called Pastor Dutchie? Pastor Dutchie Pastor... by Musical Youth, right? Huh? Pastor Dutchie by Musical Youth, I believe. Yeah, you remember that song? Yes, sir. And a lot of Bob Marley, you know, because Bob Marley was talking true. He was actually talking about the oppression in the Virgin, in, in those islands in Jamaica, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John, Puerto Rico. He was speaking, he was representing the Caribbean with his his knowledge of what he saw and the music that he had behind it gave you a vibe to make you listen more into what he was saying. You know, I shot the sheriff, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't shoot the deputy, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's everything that he was saying made sense. And then it drew you in to that vibe. Hip hop is the same exact thing. It derives from heavy bass lines, you know what I'm saying? melodies because you know jamaican music has the little pianos on top of it hip-hop of course had a hard bass some piano you know what i'm saying and it kind of let set off a melody you know what i mean so you could decipher between the two and then you know be, be, because um i come from a background of music as well and being in in places where that's all you heard was just that vibe of jamaican music coming into hip-hop was real easy it was an easy transaction you know what i mean Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's funny that you mentioned 
the vibe of reggae and how it transferred over to hip hop, you know, you can easily mm -hmm. listen to Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, The Message, and see how that could be akin to Get Up, Stand Up yeah. by Bob Marley and how if it wasn't for Chris Blackwell and Island Records, reggae wouldn't right. have been brought to the masses if it wasn't for right. Island Records exactly. and Chris Blackwell. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we're going to forward a little bit. So before mm -hmm. getting with Biv 10, were you a huge New Edition fan, and how did you end up meeting Michael Bivens? Okay, so prior to meeting them, I had a girlfriend that liked New Edition. She was head over heels in love with them. And um, prior to that, let me start here. Prior to meeting her, I remember when Candy Girl came out. And Candy Girl was such a phenomenal hit. Like, it, it was unavoidable. Like, everywhere you went, roller skating rings and stuff like that that was the song that everybody waited to hear in the roller skating ring back at the back in the, when it came out and it was just undeniably dope i heard about them i saw the video and that was it that was when i was like maybe around 12 or 13. then years later when i met a girlfriend of mine she loved new edition she liked watching them so we went, I went and bought tickets for us to go see New Edition in Madison Square Garden. So when I, watched, after watching the concert and hearing Johnny Gill sing, I was like, yo, Johnny is crazy. And, you know, they was doing the, um, Can You Stand the Rain? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That whole era was just ridiculous. So when I left the concert that night, I became a New Edition fan. Um... Years later, moving forward, I um, ended up in Brooklyn, New York City, where I, I practiced more music production. And I met a finesse. That's where I met finesse at, the part, the, my partner in the video. And finesse knew Mike Bivens because he was working directly with him. But he, he didn't disclose it to me because he and I would work on and off. You know, he'd come around, leave. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Sometimes we get into little scuffles, little arguments. He'd leave and never show. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't be around for a couple of months. But the last time that he and I had reconciled was when he had disclosed to me that he was working for Michael Bibbitt. And he was like, yo, I need some music. I'm working on an album right now for MC Brains. And I need this last song for that album. He didn't tell me Brains yet. He just said, I need a song for the last, for, for an album I'm working on. And then he's like, pack your clothes, man. We go, um, when I come back later on tonight, please be packed and ready to go. At this, at this point, I'm still, you know, practicing my production skills. You know what I'm saying? Still learning how to chop samples and still practicing. You know what I'm saying? Because in my mind, I, I, I wasn't thinking I wasn't going anywhere. I had done some work with Rob Bass, but that wasn't really anything that was going to go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? So then... When Finesse came and told me to pack it up, I, I, I laughed at him. I was like, man, get out of here. Um, you know, why should I be why should I be packing my clothes for it? You know? So he comes and he goes, We're going to LA. And this happened so random. It's like he showed up, came to my house, and was like, yo, you ready to go? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, I I told you to make sure you have your clothes packed. We're getting ready to go to California. So I looked out the window. He says, he says, look out the window. Look out the window. Limousine sitting out there in the snow. I'm talking about knee deep. Right. And we flew out to California that night and went straight into the studio. And I still didn't know who I was working for. I just knew that I was in California for the first time in a music studio. Then Finesse was like, do you know who you're working for? Do you know what, why we're making this music? And I'm like, nah. He said it's for a cat called MC Brain. And I said, oh, okay, that's, that sounds dope. And he's like, you know who hired me? I was like, nah. He said, Michael Bivin. And at that point, I was like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, Michael Bivins. And then that's how, I, that's how I was able to meet Michael Bivins through the nest flying me out to California to work on the Brains album. And like maybe a couple of days later, Mike came into the studio, introduced himself, I shook his hand. We got to talking, you know what I mean? And then that's how I met him, directly. Mike came around 
me and Finesse, and he'd watch how creative creative we were. And he was like, yo, you guys are just real creative. You should form a group. You know what I mean? Called Mark Finesse. We didn't have a group yet. We didn't have a group name yet. He just said, yo, Mark and Finesse, y'all need the group up and come up with a name. And so I was like, you know, why don't we just say Mark Finesse? You know what I'm saying? And that's that's how it happened. That's how I met Michael Bivens, and that's how a group name happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, very, very fly with the name. And it almost seemed fairytale like where you guys, hey, pack your bags, you're gonna go to LA. And then you come to find out that you're working with or for rather the man who's a part of one of the hottest groups in the country and later right. part one of the hottest offshoots from the mother group. And we mentioned Coogee Rap earlier. They sampled his voice from Poison right. for the hit. Poison. Now, that's when I became a real big fan of New Edition because they had Cool G Rap in the in the hook part. You know what I'm saying? That Poison. And I was like, oh, that's a Cool G Rap song. And then they had the sound of it kind of grew on you. Like Poison didn't just hit you right away. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It just kind of slowly, gradually crawled up on you. You know, when Ricky did that, it's driving me out of my mind. It's fine. It's and a lot of people like that part of the record. You know what I'm saying? So that was that's what really crept up on you. And you're like, wow, this song is crazy. You know what I'm saying? So that's when I became a fan. And um, I don't know if Mary J. Blige is out. No, she won't out yet. But they kind of set off a trend of hip hop smooth out with R&B. And so that's the kind of music that I took on or was already involved with kind of something similar. You know what I mean? Not mm -hmm. the hip hop pop, but just more hip hop, but it sound like it could have been a pop record. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because listening to stories on how BBD tells about Poison, it was like, hey, we really want to embrace our inner hip hop because, you know, New Edition is all about being from the school of the Temptations, the Whispers, Shy Lights, Blue Magic, because that's what Brooke Payne came up under. But they're listening to Cool G rap and all the hardcore rap when they're not in the suits and doing the crisp, clean choreography and poison was just another outlet to really express themselves outside of the mother tree of new edition. Right. And here's another insight for you. They always wanted to be rap. Like Ronnie really wanted to be a rapper. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. Mike wanted to be a rapper. So they listened to a lot of hip hop, a lot of it. You know what I'm saying? And they listened to I used to tell Mike, listen to the hottest rappers that you can get your hands on. You know what I'm saying? Um, Foxy Brown, when she came out, he bought a CD. He bought, um, what's some cats from the Philly? From Philly? Uh, three times Black though. Thought. Oh, The Roots. The Roots? I had him buy The Roots album. You know what I'm saying? I had him buy, like, everybody, Jay-Z. I had him buy the Jay-Z. You know what I'm saying? I had him buy things or artists that were hot that he can listen to and he can start learning how to format his way of, you know what I'm saying? How to be catchy lyrically. You feel me? So, but that's what their minds, their minds has always been hip hop, you know? Right. And then also, especially if you listen to Ralph's solo album with him rapping, his cadence, all rap, even though the image was GQ smooth and Bob, right. especially with Don't Be Cool right. and the whole look, the aesthetic, the rap Bob was hip hop energy and an mm -hmm. R&B outlet. Right. Right, because they were all hip hop because if you think about Candy Girl, 83, it was unheard of mm -hmm. to hear a rap section on an R&B right. record, but they were exactly. that part of that first generation that came up with rap and had to incorporate right. that. And then it just became more commonplace the further they got into their careers. And then by the time right. they got to their solo ventures, it was a rap. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this point, uh, Mark Finesse is formed and working on MC Brains. So did you meet any of the other acts signed to Biv 10 prior to the All for One, One for All video shoot? Or did you have any interactions with everybody on the shoot first time or was it beforehand? So I met Boys to Men prior to the East Coast family. Um they were still working with MC Brains on his first album. And so they had peri they would periodically visit the studio, the music studio. Mm -hmm. Then um, we had 
You remember the starter jackets, starter hats and jackets? Uh, and stuff uh, like uh, that? Uh, of course. Right. <laughs> anyway, they had an MTV shoot, right? And I think it was in Beverly Hills somewhere. And for starter hats and jackets, he was doing a commercial where he was actually all playing basketball on the basketball court. And Mike had told me and Finesse to come meet him down on the basketball court. So when I got there, that's how, that's how I was able to physically interact with Voice to Men for the first time. Like, sit down and talk with Sean. You know what I mean? Like, he was real quiet. He would, you couldn't get him to talk. And so I would sit there and kind of poke at him just to kind of get his, you know what I'm saying, his, his, his conversation on. And then, but the other guys were more vocal. Like, Nate was more, you know, he'd talk to you and stuff like that. Wanye kind of was like standoffish a little bit. Um, and Mike was more of an open, you know, conversationalist. So it wasn't hard to get along with Mike or, you know, poke at him and say, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? You know what I mean? Um, I met Tomboy, Kalei, and Hayden. I think I met them. Let me see. When did I meet them? I think we met. I met Kalei on the video shoot. I mean, um, when we was recording the East Coast family. That's when I met him. I met Hayden that way too. Um, Yvette, I think I met her on the recording maybe prior to that. I can't remember how, how I actually met Yvette, but I remember we were all somewhere and I, we met her. Could have been in the studio. Um, I met ABC for the first time in the studio, music studio, when we was recording um, East Coast family. Um, Brains I had already met because I was working on his album. You know what I'm saying? Um, big Ant was always around. The guy with the big gum, Gumby haircut. Mm -hmm. He was a father, so he stayed around. Now, he was always around. Um, and Tomboy. I met Tomboy in the studio when we recorded the East Coast Family. So the majority of them I met at the studio because Mike had already had all his groups already. He had everybody he wanted on that song. You know what I'm saying? And so we all met at that place to record. And it was in Baltimore. And yeah, the only person I knew directly was Big Ant. That was it. Mm. And yeah. Mike, of course, because Mike, I think Mike, had, Mike came in for a little while, but he had left. But those are the only two that I generally knew, you know what I'm saying, first offhand outside of everybody else that, that was in the East Coast family. Right. And the verse for the video, was it already written prior to the video shoot or was it written at the shoot? Everybody kind of went to their corners, had their stuff together, or was it already pre-written at the studio prior to going down for the shoot? We, me and Finesse worked on um, another Bad Creations music um, on their lyrics. I worked, me and Finesse worked on Red's part. So that was prior to us going into the studio. I remember when Mike telling telling us all to write a um, eight bar rap for each part for each of our parts, and he was like, um, "ABC doesn't really have anything." And Kevin Wales at the time was their manager. Kevin had wrote um, GA's part, and so me and Finesse wrote Red's part. So when you come in, if you listen to the, the video, it comes in almost like the same way that me and Finesse comes in. Siggity siggity sucka, sucka, silly for the mucka, creating the stars and run you over like a chucker. Riggity biggity rock, hmm, you want to check it? Mark rock, flip the so flip the riggity rock. Almost the same format, see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you could tell I was up writing for, for Red. Um, every every um, Lady V, she had her part down. The white guys, I think Boys to Men helped the white guys write their part. Boys to Men wrote their part. Um, Tamrock Finesse helped Tamrock with her part and MC Brains a little bit and 1010. Um, Tomboy, I think Kevin could have helped them and maybe Finesse a little bit, but he was more or less like trying to show them how to a melody on how to sing to the track itself. So it wasn't it wasn't like we had to spend all this time recording. Because it, it was just real easy. Everybody was easy to work with because they knew they were talented, first of all, and they knew how to record. So it's like, okay, just go on the booth and do this. This is what I want you to do. And if there was anything else that would need to be done that didn't sound right, they right away they had it, 
you know, because we were young. We were like, you know, kids, you know what I'm saying? So a kid, you know, you tell them to do something and they so soak it up like a sponge and they right away they do it. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't that hard. Lady B, she just came on and I'm oh, Lady B, you know, what's up with me and the East Coast family. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Positive, cool, cool little family. Then then when um Fruit Punch, Fruit Punch came on again, that was Mike, of course, that was Mike's part when he said, please listen to my demo. Blah, blah, blah. Please listen to my demo. I told Mike to say that. I said, Mike, as a breakdown, do please listen to my demo. Blah, blah, blah. Please listen to my demo. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. then Boy Cement came in. Right. Yeah. And, and when the compilation song came out, it was a huge smash. And I want to say, you correct me if I'm wrong on this, was this right around when Cool Air Harmony was starting to Bubble and come out in Aisha and Playground. So ABC and Boston Men was just starting to make waves at the time when that song dropped, right? They were already making waves. They um ABC had did Meteor Man with Robert Townsend. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh and yeah, that's had, why they got the golden lower hair. And um Boys to Men had already did the end of the road song. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Can't already be good. It was already on their way, skyrocketing from the end of the road. But what happened was Calais, I'm not Calais. Um, what's this guy's name, man? Khalil. Khalil Rountree mm -hmm. was one of the one of the managers that got killed in Chicago. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he was the Mr. Telephone Man, the Mr. Telephone Man video. Uh -huh. That was Khalil. So Khalil was with New Edition since they were kids. He got murdered in Chicago. So that was right before we shot the East Coast Family video. And Boyz II Men had already head out end of the road. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we thought after Khalil got murdered, nothing was going to happen. You know what I'm saying? We were like, oh, that it was a bad situation. You know, Khalil's gone. They were close to New Edition. We ain't shooting no video. And then about, a, I say about after, they buried Khalil about a couple, about a month or two later, we all flew out to Texas to shoot the video. Um, but it was just, it was, it was just, Boy Cement was already doing it. They had Motown Philly out. Motown Philly was already, you know, exploding on the set. They had, um, from the first album, they had um, a couple of singles that a lot of people, um, um, please don't go away. Please don't go away from me. That that Sean sang. Mm -hmm. That was blowing up. You know what I mean? So, boys, the men already had their thing. They were gone at that time. They was about maybe one or two times platinum. ABC was, I think, two or it could be. It could have been four times platinum, maybe two. But ABC had already gone over platinum already when we shot the. You know what I'm saying? So they was already on mm -hmm. the road taking off. MC Brains had already been exposed. His album was already gold already, 500,000. So you had three people that was already, that we were riding off of. We was riding off of um, Boyz II Men, ABC, and MC Brains, mm -hmm. right? So that bring in the momentum to the East Coast family. And then Mike took End of the Road and put it on the East Coast family album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I have that. Remember, yeah, remember East Coast. Remember, End of the Road was also in Boomerang. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So Eddie Murphy had a movie out with Boys to Men on it, End of the Road. And then we had an album out, East Coast Family, with End of the Road. See what I'm saying? So we was, we was working off of Boys to Men at that point. See what right. I'm saying? Right. When we had gotten our exposure. That's when everybody was like, oh, he has more? We didn't know they had, he had more besides boys to men. You see what I'm saying? So right. that kind of led up to that more momentum, more, you know, let's, okay, who's next? Who's going to come out next? You know what I mean? Right, just riding that wave. And let's just talk about how revolutionary that Biv 10 was and how Motown, primarily Gerald Busby, who was over at MCA when New Edition signed with MCA after getting off of Streetwise, went over mm -hmm. and told Bib like, hey, I'm going to give you this. You put together a roster of acts and put mm -hmm. them out and how it's pretty much standard to this day, but back in the late 80s, early 90s, that was 
unheard of to have an artist get a joint venture deal directly with a label. So can we talk about how revolutionary that was at the time and how I think Michael Bivens still doesn't get his due for what he did on the executive side and how he kind of paved the way for what was to later come with uh, JD and So So Death right. and Puff and mm -hmm. Bad Boy and how he pretty much set all of that off. Yes. And I told him that several times. I said, you started it. You started it with everybody in the industry. Everybody followed your blueprint. And you know, Mike was a very, he is, I'm sorry, he's a very intelligent person. He's not stupid, you know. I mean, things happen with schooling. Didn't mean that he wasn't smart. You know what I'm saying? He was he was very strategic in what he did. And he knew how to put things together, you know, just from watching his youth and talent shows that he was in. And, you know, he always stood by the stage watching other artists, you know what I'm saying? And then once he had Voice to Men and he groomed them into the, where they were supposed to be, that kind of opened up his mind and say, I can do this with a whole bunch of other acts. You know what I mean? And then the Big Ten, Motown Big Ten venture went down and then it was like, okay, cool, we ready to go. You know, you got a whole team of um, talented individuals with you. You ain't got nothing to worry about. We, we, we ready to take over the world at this point. You know what I'm saying? So he's a very intelligent person, man. He's, he's a great manager too. You know what I mean? Like through his connections and people he know, he just puts you in positions where you need to be at. You know what I'm saying? And I wish, I sure wish that he would have been a little more consistent you know what I mean? Because he still could have been at that point where he was when he was working with Boyz II Men. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. But things happen, you know, over, over a certain amount of time, things happen. You know, it so happened where, you know, everything just, when it, everybody went their own way, you know? Right, because I can remember it was an interview a couple of years ago when he was doing press for the New Edition store, I believe it was Breakfast Club, and was talking about Boyz II Men in the early days of discovering them and how once Jodeci came out, Boyz II Men was like, hey, we kind of wanted more of a street edge like Jodeci because, you know, they had the Alexander Vanderpool look preppy, nerdy, but they grew up in Philly and like, hey, we're not really this clean cut. We want to be more street. But it was kind of like, hey, you guys are assigned on Motown. You guys are the closest thing to the Temptations, Four Tops for this generation. So you guys have to play the part. And that was smart thinking on Bill's part, knowing that, hey, I got these four guys singing throwback style doo-wop, clean cut, and this can appeal to the masses. Right. And see, here's the thing, right? Is that at that time, pop music was only accepted by a few people. You know what I'm saying? It was only accepted by a few people. Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, right? Um, maybe Mariah Carey, because she was, you know, with Tommy Mottola, Whitney Houston, you know what I'm saying? Were the only ones that were accepted as that pop arena, you know what I'm saying? Where, okay, how do you break down the walls of pop with four guys from Philly, right? And it wasn't just the sound, you said it yourself. I put them in a preppy outfit and made them look like they were going to college. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I know that the kids buy the records. So why not present them in the, that's why Cooley High Harmony, right? Was based off the college situation, right? Um, Motown Philly. Um, and then not only that, they were in the stages of where they were getting ready to go to college. So Mike used that as a marketing tool to say, okay, we're not just going to market and do Jodeci. We're going to market and do Europe, Africa. You see what I'm saying? China, Japan. Because this is exactly what they watch. This is what these kids watch. They watch the preppy color. You know what I'm saying? So let's put them in that and watch what happens. And, and it took off. Because as you said, we all looked at Jodeci a certain way. They had a street edge, hot street R&B edge, right? Color me bad. Remember color me, color me bad? Of course. 
they had a they had a poppy street edge, right? But boys to men had a crossover pop, but they still kept it where we all can relate to it. You know what I'm saying? And they mm-hmm. were like, oh, and then by, by using Motown Philly representing the, the the you know the Philly, you know what I'm saying? Kind of gave them that respect in the street from from Philly. You know what I'm saying? And they was like, we gotta support them because they support in Philly. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's what it was. It was like really put together well. And Vita Sparks was another person that worked with Mike, you know, who I got to respect because she did a lot of marketing for the boys, to, for boys to men. And she helped with putting the image together as well, you know? Right. And I'm more partial to Cool Hair Harmony over two and over the later works, because to me, I felt that it was like akin to Michael Jackson off the wall in a thriller, how Cool Hair Harmony was boys to men's off the wall. And two was their thriller because Cool Air Harmony, majority of that album produced by Dallas Austin. This was pre TLC, and this was just him coming off of doing his production work on Troops Attitude album, mainly my music and I'll Always Love You. And then Hey Mr. DJ for George Spinderetta Irby featuring Dougie Fresh. Right. See, and then not only that, he kept everything under the new edition banner. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, Race to Man, ABC, East Coast Family, Michael Bivens, New Edition, is a, an extension of Poison, right? So everything that they did in Poison fell back on Boys to Man and ABC because they actually did the same exact moves. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like on stage, they did the, um, um, what you call it? You know, boot sneaker situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and whenever boys and men would come out, they would switch their outfits every once in a while, but they'd come out in such a way where if even if they did like a, a, a BBD move, it still came across clean because they had an image to work with. You know what I'm saying? And they had a sound. So Mike was like, let's just keep it new edition. But a lot of the other new edition members were like, nah, that's your project. That's not new edition. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it was a little friction there at one time. A little bit. Um, but they got over it and they learned to accept it. You know what I'm saying? And it just took off, man. They were like, you know what? It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? It's just boys and men, man. They just, it, it was just something, it's that once in a lifetime thing that happens. Like 50 Cent, right? right? Like when he first came out and it's just that once in a lifetime artist that you'd be like, wow, he's the man. That's the man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's how boys and men was. It was that once in a lifetime situation four guys coming out of Philly and just taking over the industry. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you mentioned the names earlier of all of the big acts in the late 80s, 80s and 90s in particular, how they were accepted by pop. So for me, it was even more revolutionary to see how Bobby's pop stock rose. Because if you look at Don't Be Cruel, that album was the best-selling album of 89. Went diamond. Bobby was able to milk that album till 92 when Bobby came right. out and he was able to cross over and just be himself. And that's, that was right. just amazing in its own right to see the heights that he went and how, because of that, that set the stage for everything else that was to later come with the rest of the group. Right. Exactly. Mm. And it's funny how you mentioned the cadence early, like stick to stick stick. And to me, it just brings the mind of uh Daz effects. That that yeah. whole kid, like boom stick it boom stick it boom that same rhyme they showed style. Up. They showed up. We was we went to a convention um the night that Mike signed his deal with Motown. We had a after party at the Cotton Club in Manhattan. And all everyone showed up. Heavy D, Queen Latifah, Dolls Effects, Tretch, Naughty by Nature. Everybody was there. And Dolls Effects was off to the side staring at me and finesse like, we about to take y'all to the stage and tear y'all apart. <laughs> you know, because you took our riggedy, riggedy, riggedy. But what they didn't know was that we were prepared for them. We was waiting for them to show up. So if you guys really want to come at us, we got some stuff for you. And, and Finesse was a freestyle rapper. He didn't write his lyrics. He was like Biggie. You know what I'm saying? So mm. he could get big stuff out of his head and embarrass you. And you'd be like, y- y'all don't want this. Y'all don't want the smoke. I was a writer. But I came from, of course, like I said, Coogee rap 
Coogee Rap wrote hard lyrics. He wrote battle rap. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I wrote my lyrics. Everything was on, oh, you ready to battle? I'm ready to go. You know what I'm saying? So when they came up, we was ready to go. So we knew we knew what we was doing. We knew that people were still listening to that sound, that Dawes and Effects sound. Stretch was doing it. They never approached Stretch. You know what I'm saying? And so when they came at us, it was like, okay, I, I, we get it, but I don't think y'all want to get up on stage and catch the smoke because it was our night. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So right. I'm not gonna, you're not gonna embarrass me on my night. You know what I'm saying? So you're ready to come on stage? Let's go. Right. But it ain't never happened. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that night, y'all wanted more than effects. We was ready. Like me and Finesse was standing at the front of the stage looking at them like, because they were just, you know how you can tell when somebody's real antsy and nervous to do something? Right. Like, that's how they was. Like, it looked like they were getting ready to jump on the stage and grab the microphone. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But Mike was talking and Joe, Beth, Joe Busby was talking. Like, Joe Busby was giving the announcement of Bib 10 and Motown doing a joint venture. And then Finesse bumped me and said, yo, look look down, look look at the stage. Look, then look off the stage, right? And I look down, I see Dr. Finesse. <laughs> staring mm. at us and then he goes don't worry about it he said you know what tonight's our night man we're gonna celebrate we on we on now just like that mm. and i said yeah you and then that was it you know right and with biv 10 being a part of motown i was curious if you had any interactions with other acts that were signed to motown at the time like the late mc trouble today or the boys the good girls not really um, I might kind of like kept everything exclusive to Bib 10 mm -hmm. and not, you know, crossing over into Motown. But I have worked with, um, the, the producer that did, um, Onyx, Shy Skills, God rest his soul. He just passed away, I think it was last year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I was working on the Brains album part two. And Shy Skills was the producer, and I worked with him outside of Big Ten. You know what I'm saying? So mm. that's the only artist that I got to work with outside of Big Ten. Mm. And I was curious about... And of course, Bell Bib DeVoe. Bell Bib DeVoe, too. Right. And I was curious about 1010. I was wondering, was 1010's kind of Mike Bibbins' response to Criss Cross? No. No? Um, no, nah, because he really wanted it to be more ABC than 1010. Because, because Criss Cross was coming directly at 1010. I mean, I'm sorry, at, at ABC, another bad creation. So they wanted, he wanted to get some of the dopest producers he knew to be on that um, ABC album. You know what I'm saying? I did Throw Your Palms in the Air um, on that album. AJ Ain't Nothing But a Number. And he, he also had Busta Rhymes on that album too. So Mike was recruiting more people for ABC to do a response more than 1010. You know what oh, I'm saying? Wow. 1010 was kind of like, yeah, 1010 was kind of like a um, a situation with parental because they were so young. They were like they were only 10 years old. You know what I'm saying? So my kind of was like, it's going to be kind of hard to maneuver because the mother's involved and you know what I'm saying? Right. Getting them to do certain things would, would be hard. So ABC already had worked with them, so they, it wasn't that hard to kind of flex their muscles and do whatever he wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? With them. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just curious because me being six, seven years old at the time when ABC crisscross and the whole East Coast family movement was going on, and especially when crisscross through the I like you know, don't be claiming that it's mental line, I knew in my head that was an ABC diss. And I was yeah. like, man, had they worked it out? Imagine the ABC crisscross tour, both of them being from Atlanta. That would have been right. huge, you know, ABC and yeah. crisscross going on tour because Jump was a massive hit for crisscross and right. later launched what was to come with JD and So So Death with Escape right. and right. the later Ruck were Usher and everything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So after East Coast Family and the momentum, were you guys told, hey, go ahead and start getting stuff ready to put out something to keep riding that wave? Yes. So um, 
I had moved out of New York City and I moved to Atlanta. And I had gotten married when I moved to Atlanta. And Finesse was still in New York. And Finesse, Mike, him and Mike had a conversation about us recording an album. Finesse flew to Atlanta. And um, at the time I wasn't, I was working at the time because we wasn't, no, there wasn't no activity going on. And there wasn't really any, mo any money being generated yet between me and Finesse. So I was working when I went to Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? And so it kind of cut in between our, our studio time and how much we could have gotten done. You know what I'm saying? So Mike did give us a semi-budget to, to record some music. So what happened was um, Finesse was still caught up in the positive trend of music, of hip hop. Right, I had already evolved because I because I watched Heavy D's album come out, Blue Funk, and he just totally took over everything after that. So I was like, Yo, Mike, we got to do some hardcore music because it's getting ready to come out, and Heavy D's about to change the industry. So Vanessa came to Atlanta, and when we started recording, he wanted to do more positive music, like he wanted to talk on some religious stuff, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yo, Finesse, I don't think we should do that. I think we should actually do some, a couple of hardcore records. And then if we want to do like additional one, like this positive, then we, we do that on, the, um, on, you know, some of the cut, um, you know, last final cut. And he and I bumped heads on that. So he more or less took control of the situation and was like, we ain't going to talk about nothing negative, no, Hardcore, nothing or whatever. And when it was finished, he went back to New York with the with the real, the real. And when they played it for Mike, he was like, "What? I can't do nothing with that." You know what I'm saying? I can't do nothing with it. I'm I was looking for something totally different than what you bring me. And because that situation wasn't matching what was in my head and how I could market, that's not it. You know what I'm saying? And so instead of finesse saying, all right, well, cool, fly Mark out to New York, you know what I'm saying? Give him a little money in his pocket. That way he ain't got to worry about going to work and whatever. Then we can go back to the drawing board and work on some new stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Finesse to the next level. He got mad and him and Mike stopped talking. So that situation deadened the Mark Finesse situation from mm -hmm. coming out. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's my story of why people didn't hear anything else from us because I let someone else take control of the situation. You know what I'm saying? That where he shouldn't have actually been in that much of it without me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's partially my fault, but at the same time, I didn't know what kind of conversations were going on when Finesse went back to New York. You know what I'm saying? All I knew was that he was angry and he didn't want to work with Mike. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So, of course, I was caught in the middle of it. So I was like, oh, you know what? Just continue working. And we're still, you know, making music and you know, just putting out my own. Well, at the time, we didn't have distribution like, like we have now. But um, just sending, you know, music to finesse, you know, to shop around with different record labels and artists and stuff like that. So that's what I was doing, more or less the background stuff. You know what I'm saying? And then um, maybe about 2012, I came out myself and started doing my own music and my own lyrics and rapping and stuff like that. But it was a, at that point, it was, it, was, it, was, it was difficult to tie myself into an audience that would say, oh, that's the Mark from Mark Finesse. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it kind of like, Dampened the situation, finesse faded off the set. You know what I'm saying? We wasn't working together no more. After that Michael Bivens situation happened, you know, things happened between me and him. I faded off. And then I just started doing my own thing. You know what I'm saying? And so now in 2022, it's a lot of catching up to do. You know what I'm saying? Now that I've um worked hard enough to provide credit enough to let people know who I am and where I'm coming from, 
thank God that they do remember where I'm from. You know what I'm saying? So now it's time for me to resurrect. You know what I'm saying? And so people to say, oh, that's what we was missing. Mm -hmm. We was missing that. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. That's the mark and finesse that should have been out. But now I'm doing it on my own instead of me and finesse. See what I'm saying? Right. And you mentioned how at that time, hip hop was getting to be more hardcore, more aggressive. And this was also at the same time when West Coast hip hop was finally breaking through outside of the West Coast with Dr. Dre, right. The Chronic, Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style, everything that was coming out of Death Row, Tupac, and how right. it pretty much... If you weren't coming aggressive or having some type of George Clinton or Zap sample, you weren't getting right. put out. Right, exactly. And that's how Mike saw the situation. He was like, the same way I'm marketing Boys to Man is how I want to market Mark Panette. And the East Coast family, if you looked at what we had on, we didn't have on no leather jackets. You know what I'm saying? No jeans and boots. We had on flower shirts with white, you know what I'm saying? White shorts. Come walking up the stairs. We was more on some jiggy shit than, than sorry, excuse my language, jiggy stuff more than we were on some hardcore stuff. So Mike was like, okay, so that's the image. That's that's what I'm going to push. But you can't push that image with positive music. You know what I'm saying? At that time, you couldn't do it. Right. So we have to do something like Will Smith. Like, you know, we should have been on some Will Smith type stuff, but a little more creative on the jiggy side of it. You right. know what I mean? Right. But that didn't happen. So it led into us not being placed out on Motown Records. Right, and it also, now that you mentioned with the aesthetic, the look in the video, and how you take a look and you saw what was going on with Puff and the late Andre Harrell over at Uptown, yeah. how they took yeah. the hip-hop aesthetic and said, nah, Jodeci, we're going to get you out these suits, ditch the choir boy, church boy image, since you're all from North right. Carolina. We're going to have y'all be in Tim's combat boots, and just really right. sell it. And then, of course, when Mary came out, that was all she wrote because she was pretty much Aretha Franklin, but with a hip hop twist. Right. But you notice that he marketed the majority of his groups the same way. Like he had, like you said, Jodeci in combat boots with the leather vests and, you know, with the jeans. And then he turned Mary into a female Jodeci by herself. Put her in the baseball, you know what I'm saying? Jersey with the hat backwards, combat boot. So that's what he knew the streets wanted. He's a and he's very intelligent when it comes to marketing. He has a main, I think he has a, a master's in marketing. You know what I'm saying? So mm. at that time, he was a young sponge and he was just absorbing everything and then applying the marketing skills he had with it and was like, I could take that and make that into that. I mm. could take this and make that into this. I can take that song and do that with this, that, and third. Look at what he did with Biggie, right? Biggie said it himself, black and ugly as ever. However, I'm still Gucci down to the socks. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That was his image. He, he, Puffy took a, a person who was not appealing and turned them into a person that everyone appealed to. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's all. Right. And they all came from the same camp. They was all doing the same exact thing. That was his strategy. I think at that point, when Mike had so much of that coming at him, he was so used to the pop edge that he didn't understand this is what the hip hop needs. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need more of a hardcore, you know what I'm saying? We from Brooklyn. We got to come with the hardcore, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, Flower Boys, <laughs> two, two guys to flower boys coming up the stairs with white shorts on, right? Mm -hmm. We coming on some positive stuff. He's like, where does it match? Right. You know what I'm saying? It don't match. Right. It, so. it doesn't It doesn't fit. And I was curious on a sidebar, did you have any interactions with the late Prince Marky D and um, Corey Rooney um, when they were working with Mary J on her stuff and how I think a lot of people still doesn't give Prince Marky D his due as a producer and songwriter could he still see him as you know what he was with the fat boys because outside of the right. work that him and Corey did with Mary J Prince Marky D's on solo stuff was bananas I mean the free album and then the love daddy album I mean come on now he was nice he's one of the nicest producers that beside you ever heard of Fresh Gordon Fresh Gordon uh names vague I probably don't recall 
Okay. Fresh Gordon did um Sweet Thing for Mary J. Blige on the album, the first album. Okay. And everything was played live. One no samples. Gordon worked for Def Jam um and did multiple albums. He even worked with the Fat Boys. See what I'm saying? So um Prince Prince Marky D. No. That's that was his name, right? Prince Marky D? Yeah, Prince Marky D. When he saw Gordon working on his craft as a producer, Gordon, he became one of Gordon's students. So what you're hearing on all those albums was from the master himself, um, Fresh Gordon. Fresh Gordon was my was Finesse's mentor. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So he mentored a lot of people because he was already in there already. He was working with Houdini, Mary J. Blige, Kid and Play. Then he was coming out with the majority of the hits that you hear on the radio came from Fresh Gordon. Okay. Mm -hmm. He did a song called um the Andy Griffin. Remember that Andy Griffin song that came out with Andy the um introduction to Andy Griffin? Mm -hmm. He took that sample and did an instrumental. They call, I think he called it Fresh Gordon. I'm not sure. But it was called Gordy's Groove. If you go go, go like Gordy's Groove, mm -hmm. he was the one that, it was a hit. It was a monster hit. So a lot of the fat boys, I never got to meet, but I met their mentor, the one that taught them how to make music. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's crazy that you mentioned Houdini and Kid and Play. And I think these two people, when it comes to production, they're talked about but they're not celebrated widely enough. The late Larry Smith and also Herbie Lovebug Azor. Can we talk about those yep. two gentlemen? Yeah. Um, I met Herbie Lovebug one time in Atlanta. Really cool guy. Um, how he kind of like um, kind of faded off a little bit. He's still a legend to me. Still, you know, pioneer. Still well known by a lot of people was Cool Mo D. But like everybody magnified the battle he had with Cool Mo D. So after, you know, Cool Mo D basically wiped him out at the Cotton Club, a lot of people kind of just, you know what I'm saying? Like faded, like faded off. Um her Herbie Lovebug, you're talking about their producer. Yeah, Herbie Lovebug producer, producer, Kid and Play, Salt and Pepper. I'm, I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about something else. I'm sorry, man. Herbie Lovebug was more. I didn't. I didn't hear too much from him. He was like more or less like one of Gordon's students too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Fresh, mm -hmm. fresh Gordon students. And then I would hear Finesse talking about him a lot, but I never Finesse never really introduced me to her. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But Finesse did do some work with Herbie Lovebug. He did do some work with him, but I wasn't. I didn't know Finesse at that at that point. Um, how me and Finesse met was actually through a situation through Herbie Lovebug. Uh, Finesse had, was partnering with another kid to do some music for Herbie Lovebug, and the kid was snaking him behind his back and talking crazy. So that's how me and Finesse got to work together. You know what I'm saying? And then Finesse was like, I was going to go with the other dude, but because he was saying some slick stuff behind my back, I can't mess with him. Now I don't want to partner with you. That's how me and Finesse got together. You know what I'm saying? But Herbie Lovebug was one of the people that Finesse did a lot of work with, but I never got a chance to work with. Who I'm talking about was Spoony G. That's who I'm talking about. Right. Like, you know, with him and um, Kumo D situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking of. You know what I'm saying? So I apologize about that part of it. Right. Right. And when you look at Larry Smith and the way they did with Houdini and Run DMC and how it still had that feel of that funk boogie era r&b where you still had live instrumentation in the studio combine that with the new sound of hip-hop because if you go listen to let's say one love by houdini you can easily hear maybe teddy pendergrass coming in underneath after houdini's rapping and how revolutionary you know it was to hear that let's say 84 85 and then of course fresh press that was pretty much one of the first big rap tours to go across the country. And of course that was put together by Mr. Michael Malden, who is the father of 
Mr. So So Deaf himself, Jermaine Dupree, who was a dancer right. on the Fresh Fest. If you look at the Freaks Come Out at Night video, little Jermaine with the curl, dancing, popping, and locking. Right. Now, Larry Smith also had an instrumental album. Did you know that? Uh, I believe so, yes. It's called Larry's Larry Love. Mm -hmm. Larry yes, love, him. Love, Larry mm -hmm. Love. You remember that? Yes. That was Larry Smith. Right, man. So that, he was crazy. doing instrumentals, you know what I'm saying? With Russell, he's doing a lot of work with Russell. <laughs> Excuse me. And he did some work with uh, Run DMC as well. Mm -hmm. That was kind of like one of the main... He played the background, but you see him in, in a few pictures with Run DMC. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But Russell did a lot of work with him. With with um with Cur Curtis Blow was the one that got Russell Simmons started. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then Larry, I think Larry worked on some of Curtis Blow stuff too. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then that's how they tied him in with Run DMC to do some of Run DMC stuff. Right. And then, of course, we know Curtis Blow won the first major rap at to sign a major label deal with Mercury, got a commercial yeah. with Sprite. And, you know, the list goes on and on. And then I want to talk about the forefathers, this group from Staten Island that merged hip hop, R&B and doo-wop, Force MDs and how Force MDs, they pretty much was the groundwork for all the groups that merged those stylings. I mean, Boyz II Men is an extension of the Force MDs. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about the legacy right. of Force MDs? Yeah. So Force MDs, Force MDs, singers. Yeah. The singers, right? It's tender Force Love, MDs. Love is a House. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the heavy set guy that was in the group? He was kind of chubby. Yeah. Um, I believe that was uh, Mercury, I believe possible i used to go to his house and make beats in his house and get on his turntables and mix <laughs> when i lived in queens i was a kid um i've always had respect for them like it's, it's like it, it, you can't i i this is what i honestly think i think new edition implemented their ways after force and you know what i'm saying like, mm -hmm. I think they watched how the Force MDs did the Temptations and stuff like that on the stage. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They had their moves down and they had some really exquisite, you know what I'm saying, music that was just uncomparable to any other sound that we heard on the radio, like you said. And when they did a performance, they kind of did more of the, like, the, the Temptation. And when New Edition, I believe, I'm not, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe Brooke Payne who, who mentored New Edition, kind of took more of a lean towards Force MD style and taught it to New Edition. You know what I'm saying? And kind of was like, okay, fellas, you're younger than they are. Let's see if we can take it and do it this with it. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because if you watch Force MD's performance, that's what they, they do a lot of temptation moves. You know what I'm saying? And then mm -hmm. Crush Group, New Edition was in Crush Group, Crush Group as well as Force MD. Mm -hmm. So, and you can tell they were really close, really close friends. Um, but Force MDs to me, in my youth, youthful days, man, they they put out some like like it's like they took they went totally against the grain, and but they made you remember every song that they put out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like okay, that's Force MDs, that's Force MDs, and then to me, Tender Love was like. After that, what else are you going to do? Right. And that record, that was Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis' first pop hit, the first of many. And, of course, I think everybody talks about this group, songwriter, producers, they're all family, and what they did with their work, and later on with Lisa Lisa and the Colt Jam, UTFO, right. Backstreet Boys, so on and so forth, how Full Force yeah. also pioneered the combination of hip-hop and R&B, prior to you know what marley marley mall did and then of course teddy and how they pretty much had the sense like hey let's take these two sounds let's mold them and let's merge them right you remember full force of course yes, so sir. full force came into play with the force md right and i think that i don't know if they were their management team i know they was putting out music too but I don't know if they were their management team or just like 
have their own publishing situation where they were actually putting out all different types of artists, like Lisa Lisa, right? You remember Lisa Lisa? Mm, Lisa Lisa um, Cool Jam. Yeah. And then they were putting out these multiple artists. So I thought, I actually thought at one time that Force and D's was full force, but they wasn't. They was actually two different entities, but I believe that full force kind of like came into the picture and kind of pushed Force and D's more creatively as well as have, you know, they, they got their deal going on and then was like, okay, we're going to put out un other, other, other artists under the full force umbrella and make sure that they do well. You know what I'm saying? Right. And they're, they're another force to reckon with too, full force, because they just, they was in, um what, the Kid and Play movie? House Party. Right? House Party, one and two. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The music that they put out, it was just like, they still they still going strong. It's like man, like, you know what I'm saying? Like man, that's what that, those were the times. Man. Right, yeah. And one group who I felt was a pop hit away from really crossing over. They were from the West Coast, considered the West Coast version of New Edition from Pasadena, California. Troop. I mean, when you look at them visually, they were dope. Dancing wise, they were dope. Very hard. I mean, Stephen Allen, John John too. No jokes. Rest in peace, Reggie. But man, I just wish Troop really would have had that one pop hit to really show the pop world like, hey, we could get down to. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? you know? I mean, it's a lot of groups then that, that were out at that time that people underrated. You know? They mm -hmm. knew the music was hot. Especially mm -hmm. coming from the producers working with. They knew the music was hot. Mm -hmm. You know, right. um, like, there was another group that um, Teddy had out um, with five kids. I forget the name of them. Hmm. It was a group that Teddy put out. Damn, I got to flip the names. I, I, my mind is, as when you get older, your mind starts <laughs> going, man. Um, hmm, I'll, I'll get back to it. But anyway, it, it was that was another group that came out that Teddy Riley had worked with. Right, mm. that um, I like the oh, way high five, you think you. high five. See what I'm saying? Like them too. You know what I mean? Like mm. they how they implemented all of the, you know, it was cool to be in a group. You mm. know what I'm saying? And how they can put out music. And a lot of people that played the backgrounds knew that they were like, you know what? Let's put out something that we we believe will be a competition to the fathers of it, or some of these in new edition. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, remember that group that um, Heavy D put out? My so for real. Man. See what I'm saying? Mm. Another group pretending to be the Jackson 5. New edition, the Jackson 5. You know what I'm saying? So a lot mm. of these folks, were, they were following in the trends of new edition. Mm -hmm. But they were trying to do something different. Right. And that's why Mike was so successful with ADC because he already had the formula. See you know what right. I'm saying? Oh, right. uh, I've been to look, I've been to Michael Jackson's house. I was, you know, I'm I'm looking at this man's records and Grammys, and we talking with this man, and he could be saying some deep stuff that nobody had never heard. And he probably could have been like, Look, when you do this on stage, this is what you do. And when you do that, this is what you do. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. So they, they had a formula. Of putting a group together, right? You know what I'm saying. And when you have groups like True, like you said, True, High mm -hmm. Five, you know what I'm saying, and the other group, mm -hmm. they all followed in the trends of the Jackson Five. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. And then coming from the Jackson Five into more of a modern um, Temptation, mm -hmm. I'd like to see something like that again come out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. Not just some a, a Korean female group. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, or a Korean all male group. Mm. I want to see an all American, African American, mm. you know what I'm saying? Right. Pop group, like another tradition. Like I'm I think that the industry deserves that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I kind of felt the last male young RB group that pretty much was following that same blueprint of new edition for me was B2K. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because B2K had that pop appeal and look and dance 
like New Edition, and they were on the verge of really exploding until they broke up after the Pandemonium album. And it's crazy how you mentioned New Edition and how in their 40 plus years, everybody from you know R&B to pop was influenced directly or indirectly by New Edition. We mentioned some of the R&B groups that was influenced by New Edition. But if you go to the pop side, New Kids on the Block, Bad Street Boys, In Sync, 98 Degrees, BTS, right. they were also influenced directly by New Edition as well. Right. right. But they but putting out artists outside of their own group mm -hmm. was a tag because they were competing against people that were trying to be like them. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Like yeah. so you had to be something different. Like you had to your your cloth couldn't it couldn't be this color like everybody else's color, mm -hmm. right? It had to be this color. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? Right. So Mike Mike was putting out groups back in the back in the day. I might be off topic, I'm sorry. But he was looking at the formula. Mm -hmm. Compared to what everybody else, you know what I'm saying? I was rocking you. off of. Now, can you imagine being around somebody that's thinking like this? Mm-hmm. That's an impact on you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it impacts you. And you're like, okay, I got to be different. I can't be the same person. I got to be this, but I can't, you know, I can't write like that. I got to write like this. I got to, mm. and it, it brings out, it brings more of that creativity side out on you. Right. Of you. Right. And it's like, okay, what else is next? You know what I'm saying? So, watching the other groups that are performing, that are implementing the new edition. Let's leave, let's leave Full Force out because Full Force was like the teachers to me. You know what I'm saying? Like they taught a lot of people how to perform. But um, the new addition, looking at them, looking at their whole situation, they're looking at it like you'll never be better than us because we've already had the formula. At one time, Boys to Men, after Boys to Men left Michael Bibbins, um, I remember going on, I was on tour with New, with New Edition back in 96 on the Home Again tour. And we went to Philly and me and Mike had a conversation about performance that night. You know what I'm saying? Because they knew that Juan Ye and Sean was going to be in the crowd. So he was like, yo, we got to really step up our game. You really got to be dope. I said, Mike, y'all already have this already. You know what I'm saying? You just got to go on stage and execute it. Mm -hmm. They're not, if they, if they didn't, if they weren't trying to see new edition or copy what you guys were trying to do or see how phenomenal your show was, they wouldn't pay to buy a ticket. You know what I'm saying? They wouldn't show up at your show. They came to your show because they know that you guys are a phenomenal act. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they are looking for other ways to learn from you. So having that situation and they're grinding and they're working so hard to get to where they're at, it embedded that you not on the same level as us. Like new addition, they can leave each other for years and come back and still be this have the same dynamic performance. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That they had prior to them coming back together again. You feel me? Right. Like it's it's that much that they absorbed. And that's why, like with Mike not doing anything, like, you know, I, I wish he would start doing more stuff. I know he's sitting back going, wow, man. I started all of this, you know what I'm saying? Or right. I did all of this and man, look at where it's evolved to, you know what I'm saying? Man, I could, I should be, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, because it's crazy when you think about it because I was just listening to recently a uh, Questlove Supreme interview that L.A. Reid did. And it was saying once the face kind of got to a point to where I got to pick either one or the other. I can't be both producer, songwriter, and label head. I got to have one get put away because something's going to give. Do you think that same situation might have happened with Bill Tennant since BBD was still white hot and then of course the new edition with Home Again in 96 that hey, I can't really focus my full attention to the label like I want because I got this going on but it's yeah. cooking like hotcakes. Yeah. I, that's a really good question. Um, I think that Mike's loyalty and commitment was to new edition always. I think that because um, 
their business with the labels, they had to, he more or less had to magnify New Edition and BBD. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, I don't think that, I think that he was pushed away from Motown Big Ten because of his commitment. You know what I mean? Mm. And I think that it's it's overwhelmed. It kind of overwhelmed him too. Mm. You know, it overwhelmed him. It, he he didn't have the staff needed to really carry that much. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when you have the weight of your group coming at you, four or five people coming at you, like, no, what you gonna do? You gonna do BBD or you gonna do East Coast Family? You know what I'm saying? Mm. What you gonna do? You gonna do this? Or you gonna do that? You gonna do this tour? Or you gonna do East Coast Family? Which one you gonna do? Right. right? Mm. Because of his loyalty and being down with them since they were like 13, you know what I'm saying? 12, 13. That instant, oh man, I gotta, you know what I'm saying? I gotta stick with my boys. Mm. And I think that played a big part of it. You know right. what I'm saying? The way he just had to put it down and was like, I, I can't let my boys down. You know what I'm saying? I gotta, I gotta be no addition. We still have obligations. We still have obligations to fill. So I can't just drop the ball on them and just go straight to Big Ten. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Cause like how you mentioned, you know, Bill was always, you know, any, any, any. Cause even if you go back and look at the cover for Poison, mm-hmm. the jacket he right. had on, he put it on backwards so that new addition could be shown at the front to let them know like, hey, even though this is an offshoot, New Edition is still with us. Johnny, Ricky, Mike, Ralph, Johnny, and Bobby, we're all still connected, even though it's not formally New Edition. Exactly. And, um, but they, but the people that he worked with, have they respect him because of it. You know what I'm saying? Like we never had, we I've never lost love for him because of my time frame. I would have liked for it to happen at that time, right? Mm. But I can't be mad at him because there was some other things going on. Right. You feel me? Mm-hmm. And it, it, that could have overwhelmed him, completely overwhelmed him. What I could blame it on is he could have had more staffing. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So if if he was going to do more work with New Edition, BBD, they could could have freed him up. You know what I'm saying? Right. On okay, I got this whole, you know, marketing staff or promotion AR. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Right. Got everybody working under the tent, you know, and so I ain't got to worry about all of that. Right. That didn't happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so it overwhelmed him, and he so he had to say he had to make a choice. He's like. Okay, either I'm doing Biv Chan or I'm doing MCA, Universal Motown. And they were looking at him like, bro, you got a you got your name signed to this, man. Right. And every every last one of us has our name signed to it too. Right. So and we can't do nothing without you. Right. Right. And I was curious to know what are the plaques that you got in the back? I'm just curious. Can you tell the people what those plaques are in the back? Get to them. Oh, yeah. All right. I'll pull them off the wall as we talk. All right. So he's going to get the plaques so that you can see and hear about his bona fides because he is bona fide, people. I'm letting you know. Okay. You see this one? Yes, sir. Can you see the whole thing? Yes, sir. I can see it loud and clear. What does it say on it? What do you what, what can you read on there? It says presented to Mark Wilson to commemorate RIAA certified gold sales and streams of more than 500,000 copies of the MCA Records release Hootie Mac, which was BBD's sophomore album, by the way, for those that don't know. Right. Now, to let you know that it's official, you see that seal right there? RIAA. Right. A lot of people have been coming. Yo, that's not real. You paid for that. Okay. Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> that's the first one. That's for uh, um, working with um, the Hootie Mac album. I did Ghostwriting on Above the Rim and Lovely. So that generated 500,000 sales, and that's a plaque for it. 
Okay, that's the first one. All right, he's going for plaque number two in RAA. For those that don't know, that's Recording Industry Association of America. Right. Here's the second one. Can you read that? All right. Presented to Mark Wilson to commemorate RAA awarded gold certification of the Motown Records album, East Coast Family, Volume 1. And people, those plaques aren't available in stores. You can't get them off eBay. You can't get them off the booster on Delancey. You got to earn those. Right. There's the sale right there. Can you see it? Yes, sir. RAA stamped and approved. Right. So those came from the production and writing with between Motown and MCA Records. Okay. All right. And I was curious yeah. to know as far as for ghostwriting is concerned, um, because I thought if you were a ghostwriter on a record, you don't get credit on the album unless your name is listed on the credit sheet when it's turned in. Is that correct or incorrect? Correct. Depends. Depends on um, if you, you got two situations. If you are paid to be quiet, that's something different. Mm -hmm. So like say for instance, um, Usher has a ghostwriter, right? And you might not see every person that's written for him on his album, you'll see Usher Raymond on it, right? Mm -hmm. Possibility that they were given a nice hefty payment up front, a piece of the publishing and royalties, and okay, it's mine, I, I paid you. I don't owe you nothing else, that's it. But it doesn't mean that I have to put your name on the album. That's one situation. Right. The second one is, um, to do the right thing, if a person is trying to get credits or build their resume, you know what I'm saying? They would include the person's name on the album or under the credits. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Because how am I going to know? For instance, I'm a, I'm a brand new producer. I just came into the industry, right? And mm. I did, a, I did a, a BBD track and it blew up. And my name is nowhere to be found on the album. But I have a contract with BBD. Right. Mm -hmm. And say if RIAA, for instance, they said, oh, the album is platinum. Who are they going to present it to? They're going to present it to the artist, right? The person that wrote on the song. So if there's nobody's name on the album, on, on the credits, who are they going to present the plaques to? The original artist. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm wrong to keep you off of that because, you know, as I was saying, you know, as I showed you, the only way for them to get my name on there was to have my name on the credit. Mm. See what I'm saying? Right. They could say, they could say, um, oh, you know, we got a we got a plaque, but we'll send you a plaque after it goes gold. Yeah, even though it says down. So what it'll say is it'll say, um, produced by it'll have nobody's name, and it'll say this plaque has been um presented to um Daryl Gibson. Right? right? So now I'm like, well, my name wasn't on there. How am I going to get a plaque? I know that's my music. You know what I'm saying? Right. I got to go to Daryl Gibson and say, yo, Daryl, I mean, what's up with my plaque? I mean, that's my music. You know, what's what's up? He go, well, bro, your name wasn't on the album. I mean, you you can't, I can't get it approved because your name wasn't on the album. See how that works? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. I would recommend that everybody that's doing work with each other that even though it could be a trend of you not putting somebody's name on the credits, the only right thing to do is to put somebody's name on. Right. Definitely do that because industry rule number 4080 is still in full effect because you got to know the business first before you get right. into even the thing called music or show because it is a business right. first because if you don't know right. the business you're going to learn the hard way. And we've seen stories, heard stories of artists that had to learn the hard way mm -hmm. about when it comes to royalties, publishing, right. IP, and ownership right. is key. Don't sell your stuff for that brown paper right. bag with the money or that Cadillac because that right. publishing is going to be what's right. going to have you eating, your parents eating, right. your kids eating, their kids, kids eating. So wise up, exactly. know your stuff. The information's out there. Exactly. Right. Not only that, when you distribute music um, these days, before you actually hit the submit button, it asks you, it says, who's the writer? 
Who's he affiliated with? Who's the producer? Who's the producer affiliated with? How much does the writer get? How much does the producer get? It tells you before the music is even submitted. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's a part of the meta metadata inside of the music. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The um, IRSC, the IS, I, I think it's called um, ISWC or something like that. Um, a UPC. You know what I'm saying? You have it's so many things that involve a record that if it's not probably added into the metadata, that's the way it comes out. And you're gonna have a lot of people confused and angry because I just if I signed a contract with you directly and I said, okay, cool, I did the music, this is my production, this is my production, publishing. Make sure, even though in, in contractually. Make sure you put my name on the album for a third reason, your resume. When you um, are dealing with professional people in business, if your name doesn't appear on those credits, to them, you're just an idiot. Like, you're a fool. Like, don't, don't come in my face and tell me about something you did when your name is not even on it, right? Mm -hmm. Not only that, Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia adds in information on an artist where you can actually um, authenticate yourself, right? On social media like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know what I'm saying? Mm. We, they use the Wikipedia outside of Google to look you up to see how credible you are. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So it's just, it, it has, it's there's three rules to that. But a person that does not do it, to me, is a, to be, to be honest with you, they can say, oh, I forgot to put the lyrics. I forgot. No. To me, it appears as if though you want to steal information or you want to steal something. Right. Yeah. Like I said, once again, know, know, know the business because if you don't, you are going to get taken advantage of and you don't want to get taken, taken advantage of. You know, ownership is key. And if you're planning on going with a major, it almost feels as if now you got to have some type of track record, some type of noise. Right some type of numbers that shows the analytics why the labels should partner with you because you're a money-making venture to them. If, if you're not making right. any noise, you can forget it and just keep going independent. But if you're still going independent, you still got to have numbers. You still got to have the analytics. You still got to have some muscle, some type of machine backing you. There's no way getting around it. Exactly. There is an actual web website, right, that actually tracks professional credits and the only way that it's able to track your data is if your name is on the music you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. i forget the name of it but i'll share it with you I'll, I'll send it to you but it's it's a website that does that and the only way for you to be qualified to be on that website is if your name is on the credit right if you produce the record and your name's not on the credits they're going to say this song does not belong to you because your name is not on the credit Mm. Now for those credit sheets, yeah. Now for those credit sheets, not to cut you off, does it go to either BMI, ASCAP, or Sound Exchange? Um, Sound Exchange, you can actually go in and do it your do it yourself. If you want, you can um, manually um, do it when you're uh, putting out your distribution. You can check because on, on all the stores, Sound Exchange is one of the ones that you can check. So you you check that box. And it'll automatically go to Sound Exchange, or you can go to Sound Exchange directly, log in, and input your IRSC, right? Name of the title, song, and register it that way. You know what I'm saying? If you have fear that people aren't going to add you into the to the um the publishing or give you the proper credits for that song. Right. Yeah, because we're trying to do all that we can for all the up and coming artists to make sure that. You're not getting taken advantage of no Vaseline style because, like I said, it's not pretty. And especially, you know, if your stuff become a hit and you have nothing to show for it. Because if you go back, look at the clip from TLC's Behind the Music with Left Eye, rest in peace, when she was breaking down the numbers and how after all the records they sold with Crazy Sexy Cool, they only had X amount of dollars between the three of them to split. Once everybody else got their cut, because as an artist, you're always going to be the last to eat. 
Everybody's going to eat off the plate before you do. The advance, mm -hmm. that's just a fancy term for a loan, and it's going to have to mm -hmm. be paid back. So try to make sure right. that if you're going to get a deal, make sure you get at least a dollar. If you can't get a buck for a record, go at least 50 cents, 75 cents. And if you go indie, right. you may be able to get more than a dollar per record sold. So that way right. you can have some money in your pocket because if you ain't making no money from record sales, you're going to be out touring. But watch out for that too right. because they're starting to come for that merch money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, it's, it's just so much things that's out here that we have to educate ourselves on. I'm still learning too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it doesn't come overnight. I mean, a book, a book on the music business itself, just to read a book is this thick. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, it's not something I could read overnight. Mm -hmm. I had to take time and go through each chapter and figure out or skip to the chapter when I come to that, that situation. You know what I'm saying? Or actually go to that chapter. Right. But a lot of people that are doing music right now aren't reading at all. Right. They just want to be seen. I want to be on TV. Right. Or my stuff to be on the radio. Right. You know? You got your song ready um, um uh, rotate on the radio, right? Right. You ain't got nothing registered. It's just on the radio. It's just it's nothing. So then you the royalties come through. The person that that that's that's on the song, performer, writer, collecting royalties. But you didn't register your music through ASCAP or BMI or Sound Exchange. So now the person's collecting a big fat royalty check and you're sitting there going, damn, I made that beat. How come I didn't make no money? The artists that you're working with, especially if you don't know who they are, have their own administration and team already. Mm -hmm. They don't work for you. You know what I'm saying? You got to get your own team of people, individuals to come in and work with you if you want a serious situation. Right. You cannot expect someone else's team to do the work for you. Because they're gonna they're gonna find every loophole to jump through not to pay you. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why it's important to know specifics when you put out music or when you're working with other individuals in the professional music business. That you that this this is clear that this is what's gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, make it plain, have it in black and white. And the last question I want to get with you before we talk about shout outs and current projects. How has streaming mm -hmm. changed the business and upended how the old model is no longer efficient and how click, upload, direct to consumer? How has streaming and the internet changed how the music business is done? I think that the In the internet, let's let's look at the words internet and let's look at marketing, right? The internet changed music because now it allows you to market yourself more freely. You don't have to worry about paying a marketing agency to put up billboards and signs and whatever. Some still do, but you don't have to worry about that. You can just go online. You can put out a post or a picture and just say, hey, here go my music and people can see, mm -hmm. right? I think it's changed for those reasons, for marketing reasons. Now, when it comes to music reasons, um, because we don't have that much protection over our music or to protect our music, it has caused the industry to say, we can't sell records like we used to. We can't sell five, five, you know, nine ninety nine, twelve, thirteen ninety nine anymore. We got to rely on somebody going to Amazon.com you know what I'm saying? To buy it for a dollar and ninety nine cents. Think about it. On album for four dollars and ninety nine cents, compared to when it used to be nine dollars, ten dollars. You know what I'm saying? With CDs and tapes. So it's a big, big difference when it comes to that. Um, I wish that Apple. I know Apple. I think I think they implemented too. They're paying. You know, you pay Apple iTunes, you download the music. You know, you get paid royalties from that. I get it. But Spotify is, is a lot with Spotify. You know what I'm saying? And their streaming platform is kind of like so uh, suspicious in some ways. You know what I mean? Like you can get all these streams and it's like, okay, but how come you're not paying me? Why are you not paying? Why are you only paying me like half of a cent? 
You know what I mean? But you're charging people $9.99 for premiums, $14.99 a month for premiums to listen to my music. Let's count $14.99 times 12. We're going to do some math, people. So get your calculators out and get ready to do your math. You know what I'm saying? Let's do that real quick. I'm sorry. I mean to pause, but nah, you I'm good. Pull up my calendar. Calculator. Okay, let's go. I'm seeing out. I'm at zero. Can you see that? Zero? Yeah, yeah you're, at, you're zeroed out. And we're talking about just one person, $14.99 for Prime, for, you know, for a subscription to Spotify, mm -hmm. times 12. $179.88. Right. But 12 months of premium. Mm -hmm. How many users does um, Spotify have? Let's say a million. Mm -hmm. 179.88 times one. We're looking at $179 million. Mm -hmm. Right? If they have a million subscribers, that's a million. They have over 5 million subscribers, close to 10 million, maybe even more. You see the money they're making? Right. Compared to what they're paying somebody to stream their music, a penny, half of a cent. Come on now. Come on, come That's on in now. a year. So look, 179, 179 million, right? Watch this. Right? Times 12. That's almost a billion dollars, like $2 billion. Mm -hmm. That's why when you read articles and they say Spotify has grossed over two point something, six point something billion dollars in a year. That's for these premiums. Right. That we're paying for. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So they messed it up for the artists who, who would, would normally sell their music, right, at $9.99. So let's do calculations on that one, right? $9.99 times one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Times a million sales, right? Right. You got nine million nine hundred and ninety dollars mm -hmm. out of a million sales nine ninety nine, right? Right. So that that's just for tapes by itself. Let's add in another um, plus nine ninety nine zero 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 zero. Right. Now we're doing CDs. CDs could be a little more. So the person sold a million tapes and a million CDs, and and out of that, this is how much money he's made just off of CDs and tapes. Nineteen million dollars, right? right? Then we got Wax. Remember, Wax was out. Mm -hmm. Everybody's buying Wax singles for like what two ninety nine, three ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got two ninety nine times a million. Two more million. So we're looking at $21 million that an artist could make off of CDs, tapes, and and and, and um and wax, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to what Spotify is paying an artist ten thousand dollars for a million stream. That's crazy. Ten ten G's and you're splitting half a penny. You cannot split half a penny. It's like the equivalent of let's say you're out on tour and you're noticing upstairs in the box office. They're counting the receipts. They're hoarding the good chunk of the more money in the suitcase and only taking one one dollar bill out and saying, "Here's a dollar for you." And you taking it, please, as punch. Yes, and not only that, we're also taking the music from their platform and promoting it on another platform that has over five billion users. 
You know what I'm saying? Mm. That's just Facebook by itself. Mm. Then we take another pr promotion, maybe even buy an ad and promote it on Instagram where their algorithm is just, it caters to celebrities and how much money you paying for that ad. Mm -hmm. So now you're giving back, but you're still not gaining because Spotify isn't paying you. So you're still coming out of your pocket to promote and working against yourself. Right. Compared to when, when labels were just collecting 23, 24 million dollars you know what I'm saying? Off of each section, tapes, CDs, and wax. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the artist got 50% of that, or you know, a point or two points, and they came away with three, four million dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. Compared it's... to now. What are we bringing home? Nothing. $10,000? Right. Are you serious? Right. That's how that's how artists are being used. African American artists like myself, you know what I'm saying? Especially, especially our culture and our culture, because we, we're not educated on how much money these platforms are making off of us. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. At one time, the record labels were making them that money off of us, but they couldn't hide that much because it was it, it was always a paper trail, mm -hmm. right? Even though they tried to burn everything up and throw it in the trash, there's still no way you couldn't get around that. There's still a paper trail. For mm -hmm. tax purposes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. Here, it's streaming, okay, well, this is how much we'll pay. And if you want to be on our famous platform, this is how much we're going to pay you, whether you like it or not. You don't have to be on Spotify. You can take all your music down on Spotify. But what is Deezer paying you? What is Apple paying you? What is Tidal paying you? These people are billionaires. They And then not only that, check this out. They can sell their platform and sell the right stuff everything on that platform and not give you a dime of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because once you sign to be on that platform, you're pretty much giving them consent to do whatever they please with your stuff. Because once you sign that paperwork, it's not yours no more. It's theirs. Exactly. It's theirs. They could sell the whole catalog to Spotify right now for $3 billion, and you will never see a piece of $3 billion. Mm hmm and that is why you're just placed. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So now you're placed in care of another company who's just as worse. You know what I'm saying? And so now they're saying, oh, we're going to have to lower the streaming costs because, because, because. Mm. But they still got subscribers coming in, still marketing to subscribers, add dollars. You know what I'm saying? Draining us. Mm. You know what I'm saying? to be on a platform that they deem to be the most popular platform. Right. It's a big, it's a big gap difference between the two. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So streaming music is cool because you can hear it and listen to it anyway. That's good. But when it comes to the pay, the pay is horrible. Like, you know, if you could just go out and sell your own music, physically sell it out or build your own website and put your own music on there mm -hmm. and let people buy it through PayPal, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Or any other way, you benefit more because you don't have to split nothing with nobody. Right. You don't have to worry about somebody buying a, um, a subscription, you know what I'm saying, to listen to your music where you're not even going to say half of what they're paying. Right. Mm -hmm. You get to cut the middleman out. It kind of reminds me of how back in the day, like Hammer, Too Short, E-40, those acts out the bay and other areas, how they would just pop the trunk, go to like McCola or Independent Press and Plant, Pop it up, yeah. press it up themselves, pay the money out, mm -hmm. go sell it to swap me, whatever. And all of that money's coming to you. You don't have to split it with nobody. Right. And you're making so exactly. much noise on your own. And you set up your own right. regional distribution network within your region. The label's going right. to, I heard you sold right. this, this, this independent. We want to do a joint venture with you or right. sign you directly with the label. And I think that's why we're seeing a movement like how we're seeing like Ashanti. Taylor Swift yeah. and some other acts re-recording their old material so that they can have full 100% ownership because I go back to Prince and look at the right. model with what he did with, you know, mpg.com and how he was putting his albums direct to consumer online and this was in the mid-90s before everybody knew the power of the right. internet and how he was yeah. big on 
own, own, own DIY, DIY, yeah. DIY, DIY, be your own boss. Don't let these labels yeah. own you. You own them and you can be a bigger boss because of that. Right. Man, we said a mouthful. We hope you all got an industry education today with this interview with Mr. Mark Payne. So before we close, talk about any current projects you got working on, shout outs, and also plug your social media, brother. Okay. Um, currently um, producing, working with um, one another, um, for two hip hop legends right now. I'm working with uh, Mikey D who actually started his career with LL Cool J. Um, I'm working with him. And then I'm also, I just um, recently released two singles with Positive K, who was another legend in the industry. Um, I just released a song called I Get It Done and Nobody. So that's out now and that's streaming now under Positive K. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm doing now is just doing more product music production. I also have songs out on my own with my own content, rapping, lyrical. So if you want to hear the Mark from the Mark Finesse, then you would hear, go to my page at Mark Payne on Spotify and you pull up God's People. That's my, la my latest one. Then I have another one called Broken Child. Broken Child is ridiculous. Like I have another artist on there named Nava Hooligan. And he and I have been really close. He's phenomenal. So that's one of, that's from my own personal projects. That's something that I would, recommend you know everyone listening to it speaks about um the brokenness of an individual even what when he was young coming up into you know manhood and understanding what's going on in life a lot of us come from broken situations so that's what the song is based on god's people is about you know today today's times how politics have turned around the attitudes of individuals how they turned around their personalities and how they behave towards people you know these are people that say oh i'm god's people i'm a christian i'm this and that so I put out a song called God's People. What happened to God's people? You know what I'm saying? Mm. On my own. That's um, um, currently circulating now. You can find me on Instagram um, at The Real Mark Payne. You can find me on uh, Facebook at The Real Mark Payne. You can find me on SoundCloud at just Mark Payne, type up Mark Payne. I'm on Genius as well. Genius is a big website where they credit your work as well. That's genius.com forward slash Mark Payne. Um, of course, I'm on YouTube. I, I, I populate Instagram more than any of the other platforms. Um, so you see me more on, between is Instagram first, then Facebook. Um, I had a website up. I'm still working on that right now. I got to redo everything all over again. So I apologize if I, wouldn't, I didn't have that information today. But you can always find me on social media. If you uh, under my Instagram page at the Real Mark Payne, there is a link right under my profile where you can visit all of my social media pages um, directly. It's, it's it's like a big huge link area where you can go in and just click it, and you can just visit me there. Um, but big shouts out to you, Gerald, man. I appreciate you having me on the show. I know it's probably some things that we probably skipped, some things that you probably wanted to hear a little more of, but. You know, that's just me in a nutshell, man. You know, it's just Mark Payne, man. You know, me and Finesse, we no longer work together no more. You know, I'm, I wish him the best in life. I wish that everything in life is successful for him. Um, but at this point, I'm by myself right now, and I'm doing everything, you know, on the solo grounds right now, doing uh, independent music production. Um, if you want music, let's negotiate. I don't, I don't work for free. Of course, you know that. Um, please don't come at me for free. I'm not going to respond to you. Um, so if you want music or you want to purchase some music, you can always come to my Instagram or Facebook, reach out to me and say, hey, Mark, this is what I need. Um, if you need uh, maybe like some music for some of your projects or whatever, I'm also willing, I'm open for that as well. Um, if you need music for your backgrounds or whatever you're doing, I'm, I'm open for that. But other than that, um, that's about it, man. And folks, like you said, he's not for free, free, maybe he'll do it for charity. Never, never think right. of judging me. Shout out That's to right. Pete Rock. Shout out to CL Smooth. Shout out to mm -hmm. Pete Rock. Shout out to Nice and Smooth. And also, you can catch this interview wherever you stream podcasts and on YouTube at youtube.com 
slash Beyond the Album Cover and follow me on all the socials at Beyond the Album Cover. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big thank you, round of applause to multi pilot producer, songwriter, former member of the East Coast family, Mr. Mark Payne. Mr. Payne, thank you for coming on, sir, to Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you. I appreciate you. It was great being here with you and I do appreciate the interview. Yes, sir. Thank you.